So part B, now we move into big data, analytics, and a little bit about complexity. All right, I always like to start with a story. Target, big data gone tropo. Why would I pick Target? Well, Target, like many, many other retail companies, tracks the pages that you're on. So when you're online, you're in there, you're looking at products. Doesn't matter whether you clicked add to cart or not, it knows that you're being on that page looking at that particular product. It assigned, decided to assign a pregnancy prediction score to individual users. So these are people that are spending time on their website. You might be able to guess this story about what's going to happen. By analysing the types of products, it could estimate the due date for birth and supposedly within a reasonably accurate time frame. All right. Why would it want to do all this? Well, because we can use it for sales. We can send out deals for people. We can, we can send them targeted ads through social media linked back to a target website about prenatal, postnatal products. Right. But a father storms into a Target store to berate them for sending his teenage daughter coupons for postnatal products, basically sending her stuff to say, hey, we kind of know that you're pregnant. You don't say it outright. So here are these products because we know that you're pregnant and, uh, and these are the sorts of things you're going to want to buy for your, for your baby when he or she is born. His father's gone, are you nuts? You've sent this to a teenage girl. But... Target was correct. The father didn't know. His teenage daughter was pregnant. Now, okay, so yeah, Target got it right, but it didn't get the PR right at all. All right, so this is not a, oh, yes, Target was right in the end, it's all okay. This is, this is the challenge, one of the challenges around how big data can be used. It's tr they're trying to be predictive here, okay. They have a obligation to sell more product, make more profit for their shareholders. Yes, they do. But, you know, they didn't know the age of the person they were sending the coupons to, but they've got an issue here in how they use, um, analyse and use big data. Big data quiz. 90% of the data available to analyse is unstructured, right? By 2020, 200 billion devices Oh, this is just nuts. We'll generate different types of data. Which of the four Vs does this relate to? A, B, C, or D? All right. Relates to variety. And you can go and look at, oh, one of you guys will know, whichever figure is the right one there, 2.6. All right, 2.6. You can see there the four Vs. You can also... Hear about the four Vs in our LMS video about big data, all right? Which, uh, which has got some horrible acting by me in it, but it's trying to make the point about how we're tracked, how big data can be used, especially in things like retail. It's it's, it's going to be used, it is being used everywhere, but retail obviously is a key area because the more you can segment and target and focus onto your customer, if you can get me when I am thirsty and I've had a long day in the garden and I just would like a cold beer and target me at that point, think about my purchasing behaviour, my decision-making at that point. I have a, an inherent demand that is more concentrated at 4.30 in the afternoon, the sun in my backyard, than I do at, um, at 9 the next morning, all right, when I'm not going to, to want a beer. All right, that's all I need to do in that section because I think it, it's fairly sure. What it moves into now is this idea of complexity. So we wanted to make sense of the idea of a complex problem. Again, it's I'm going to try and apply it to something because it's this is a difficult little bit of uh, material here. There's an LMS video with Courtney that will help, so have a look at that. Complex problem. They sometimes get called messy problems, wicked problems. It doesn't matter. Um, just think of it as a con complex problem. Ill-structured. What we mean by that is that it often doesn't have a defined start and end. Okay, it's, it's, It is messy like that. Um, there are different key attributes. I'm going to talk about eight, I think. The study guide talks about four or five. It doesn't really matter. This just give you an idea of how you can look at something and go, oh, yeah, that's a complex problem right? Nonlinear interrelationships, connections. 
I've picked this one because I think it's a massive problem for Australia, as it is for countries like the, the US and the UK, okay? It's a messy problem, it's complex, it's, it's obesity in our country. The boundaries are unclear, the problem's often ill-defined. In that sense, yes, you can say someone's obese, but you've got to go to a broader thing of what does a healthy society actually look like? There's smaller interrelated problems. How do you become obese? Well, you don't eat healthily. That's one way. What about you don't exercise? Ah, what about you come from a disadvantaged background? Okay, how, how does this interrelate? Well, you don't have much money. What's the cheapest meal you can get? Probably Maccas. You live in an outer suburb of the city because the rent is a lot cheaper um, for your parent or parents, right? Where do these guys set up their stores? In exactly those places. Actions to fix have unforeseen consequences. In Australia, we have started this debate and then it stopped and we'll start again. Should we have a sugar tax, right? Uh, we won't have the debate because it's just me here. Yes, we should have a sugar tax because it, there's a direct uh, impact with a reduction of types of foods and a healthier society. And it's been seen already to have shown that overseas. But is there, is there an unforeseen, unforeseen consequence that we're targeting poorer people because we end up targeting these people unfairly um, charging them more for food when they already don't have that money, much money to go and buy food. We're saying to them, hey, you should be healthier. By the way, it's going to cost you 30 40% more to purchase fresh fruit and vegetables and be healthy. There's overlap with other problems. Like I said, there's overlap with um, uh, physical ailments, with mental health, with socioeconomic problems. You can't solve these things in isolation. It requires a mix. It requires sometimes tech. It normally requires social activities, economic stuff. It requires thinking about values. It, in the end, a complex problem does result or require often a paradigm shift, a fundamental shift in behaviour, okay? It also requires in us, people, taking a certain amount of responsibility for them. Now, there's a weak model. I've actually kept these slides from last semester, this bit. Um, it's now, I don't know why, but it's now seven steps in the study guide. It was eight. The only thing they did was make step one, noticing and bracketing instead of what it used to be. Step one was start, start with chaos. I can't explain why. So I'm leaving it as it is. Starting with chaos means you accept there is more information to find. There is more to this problem. It is ill-defined. It is non-linear. You accept that, okay? It is actually a step that you need to do. Otherwise, people move straight into the politician type mode of, oh, well, the fix is just A or B. You've got to do A or B and that's it because they believe that we're not smart enough to consider that it's not as simple as A and B. All right? You know, obesity in women, as dangerous as terror threat. All right, maybe. Noticing and bracketing. So you've got to collect this information and think about things. Demographics, health, think about government spending and what areas are they spending it in. Think about lobby groups. How does the food industry deal with this? How do they do their packaging and their advertising? What is being done in schools around healthy eating? What Have tuck shops and canteens changed over the years? You move to this idea of labelling. You've, you've got to bucket the data or put it in bins or buckets, right? You have to to label it in order to be able to show the relationship, interrelationships, interlinks between different data sets, that enables you to find key areas of focus, right? Otherwise, you can't make a decision that maybe you need to look at fast food advertising on TV. How do you come to that decision, right? One way is you just say it, yes. The correct way is that you actually have to go back and you have to look for all that data and start to bracket it. But even then, you're not sure. So then you need to look for patterns, okay? That's what being retrospective means. Proceeding patterns, how do we link between obesity and different actions that we take as individuals or as government or as food companies? Now you've got to connect the ideas to the experiences and the information available to start to come up with some key 
descriptors, some key statements, concluding statements. Right? There's a high concentration of fast food options in lower socioeconomic regions. These regions have a higher percentage of overweight and obese people. Can we get to that statement and for it to be accepted or not? Social and systemic, right? This messy problem or complex problem has to involve community education, most likely, because we, we know it can't be fixed with one thing. To, to move to a paradigm shift, education will be part of it. If a government tries to just impose one fix, like a tax, right? they will probably get the boot because it will be jumped on in a negative light, whether it's by media or their opposition political parties or whatnot, or the public will jump on it and say, you can't just do that. There's, there's no one thing fix here. Okay, Taking action and communication, this is where trial and error needs to begin because you need to find out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, this is where complex problems often fall down, Okay, because the risks of taking action is that something won't work straight away. And if, if you're not firm as a, a person in a position of power to do it, whether you're government or whether you're the CFO, or CEO of a company, this is where you will start to feel pressure. If people see that one thing hasn't worked and they jump on it, then there comes this element of hesitation, all right? With all of this, communication should either be step eight or it should be written across all steps because it's so critical the whole way through. Good managers, Bring order to chaos. That's one of the things in terms of complexity in an organisation. You'll see that good leaders, good managers help get their teams and others that might be struggling with complexity and make it simpler. Accountants are dealing with complexity all the time through data and financial concepts. All right? Examples of how it can be reduced, things like mapping, breaking up complex uh, processes into steps, complex data sets into smaller data sets. Right, working out how to get summaries that people can understand and read. Because if you present data that is just um, overwhelming to people, then no one can make a decision on it. Okay, so I spent a bit more time than there probably is allocating the study guide, but I think it's a really important concept. Okay, the next part of part B, data mining. So Cambridge Analytica, read the example there. It's really interesting. Everyone's heard of this company's name, but I think I reckon most of you don't know, like I didn't, exactly what happened. Why was it such a big blow up? Was it all about getting crooked Hillary, as Trump said? Or was it actually about the fact that our data is being taken all the time from things like social media platforms? Right? But don't just think social media. Every time you sign up to a company and you go accept conditions, you don't read all the conditions, but in those conditions is we can take your data. Fine. Once we do that, then it's about, well, how can we use your data? What is the level of privacy that we adhere to, right? Making sure as it should be that that level of privacy links to the government in the country that you're sitting in and their expectations in legislation around privacy. One other thing, and look, it won't be short. I can't remember how long it is now. It's probably 40, 50 minutes. Uh, Recode Decode is a really interesting podcast. Democracy is for sale. Um, uh, Cara, Cara Schwisser, Swisher, let me get it right, uh, is talking to Julian Wheatland, who was a previous executive that probably had to leave Cambridge Analytica. But it's really interesting to listen to the podcast, and I guarantee you'll learn a lot. If you've got the extra time, I, I reckon that's fascinating. Um, so is data mining worth it? Well, yeah. 2018, Qantas received $1.55 in revenue from its frequent flyer program and made $372 million on it, okay? That's that's why, you know, that's why we get our credit cards and we try and pay for everything, pay for Coles and Woolies and pay our bills if we can on it and whatnot to get our points. Qantas is now making massive changes to this program. Um, I'm not sure what's prompting it. I believe some of it is a bit of consumer backlash. So if they make this much money, that is on you and I believing it's worthwhile getting these damn frequent flyer points, right? Having our credit card linked to it as you decide whether it's worthwhile to have a flybys card or not. So I think what's happened here is that some people have got annoyed. I know one of the things is because um, my wife did it and that was around You've got your points, but then you go and try and book a flight and it's near impossible. 
because there's only a limited amount of seats. So I believe that Alan Joyce announced that they were going to release a lot more seats available for frequent flyer purchases, redeeming your points that you have earned on uh, through the frequent flyer program. Uh, I think on the downside, they were going to require set higher point values for certain flights. So maybe it costs you 150,000 points instead of 125,000 points to get to Los Angeles, whatever it is. Certainly, you've got to have over 100,000 to really do much at all, right? But is it is it valuable? Absolutely. Uh, as an example in the study guide around Woolworths, all right, and, and you know, why would these supermarkets, why would they even bother to think about car insurance, house insurance, to move to insurance products? And they're not. They get an underwriter. They don't do the insurance management. They're just selling you the premium, right? The big companies are still doing the underwriting. But why? Because they can data mine, because they know that people that purchase a lot of red meat and milk have a lower accident rate, right? For whatever reason, they're probably families who are purchasing for the family, the mum and the dad, and a number of children, right? Teenage boys that drink, you know, two litres, a litre, a litre and a half of milk every day. So for, for whatever reasons, they can link those two up. They can then, remember I said, focus and target a particular type of insurance product to these people and capture that market. Um, people that buy, I think this is right, that buy lots of rice and pasta have more accidents and no doubt they're probably male. So they'll have the data that's known to everybody, yes, that males was it, under the age of 25 or whatever, a higher probability of having an accident, absolutely. But they're going so much further now. They're looking at every single purchase you've made on your credit card. What I want to talk about is machine learning, and here's a guy that does it with a watermelon. You've asked about machine learning, and we have a watermelon here. You know, you used to uh, go to the store, pick up a watermelon, uh, maybe your family told you, you push on the end to see if it's soft and that means it's a good watermelon or if it smells a certain way, that's how you tell if it's a good watermelon. Well, with machine learning, you don't do any of that. You basically try to determine all of the attributes about this watermelon that you can, and you take those attributes and you feed them into a baby machine model that knows nothing. Um, how fat the stripes are, how thin they are. And, and you, you feed all these attributes into that model, you go home, you eat the watermelon. You come back in the next day and you tell that model, that was a good watermelon. And it remembers all of those attributes and the fact that it was good. And you're gonna do that every day for the next 10 years. After 10 years, that model is gonna be able to tell you based on attributes that you give it, if the watermelon you've picked up is good or bad. And you may not know why that that model is telling you it's good or bad. Um, but you can trust that it has done enough analysis and it can tell you a percentage, a surety of whether it's good or bad. Now, when you pick up a watermelon, give it the attributes. If it says it's good, you can take it home and it will be good. Cool. So I just like the explanation because, well, it's, uh, it, it's short. Yes, it's just a watermelon. But what it's trying to show is that machine learning comes about from code being written that requires inputs, more and more inputs, and it learns. It, it has inputs, there's an output, it looks at the output as an input and does exactly the same thing over and over again, all right? And it's about computing power. Th that ability's always been there to be able to code to do that, but the computing power has never been there. And the introduction of things like a quantum computer just completely changed the landscape of what we can achieve in both machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are essentially very similar. You know, in a way to me, kind of the same thing, but AI is then at a higher level. So it's algorithms that learn directly from their data inputs, right? And I started to think about it. First thing I get my head around, oh, practice exams, the written component, not for you guys, but for GSL. Thousands of these things to mark. Not that much fun. How can I do it? So I looked around as to what was being done in this space. And this is basically what I learned. If I mark 50 written responses and the machine learning observes this, then I mark another 50, it learns more, right? So I've marked 100 and it's picking up. I give the system my rubric. Now, your rubric is your marking grid that a teacher uses to say, if these points were found, 
0.25 in mark, these points one, these points 0.75, and you get to your total, four, six, 10, 12 marks. And so that's the way that you'd be consistent, you'd be fair to students, you mark against a rubric. So I give my rubric to the system, the code takes over and marks the next 20, right? Could be 20, could be 50, could be 10. What's important is that it stops at that point or I stop it, I review, I make changes, then the code look the code takes those changes as new inputs to go, oh, I've got to refine more. Go back to the watermelon. You're marking it to say, well, these you got all these ones right, but these four watermelons were underripe. Why were they underripe? Well, we we actually didn't tell you, machine learner, um, about the fact that when the, the yellow and green stripes are too close together that signals it's not right or with it's a particular size or something that we hadn't done so we put that input in and then the process goes on and on and on and that's how it, that's how it works no i can't do it this semester it's not ready but i did notice uh through another recode decode podcast from Kara uh, swisher that pearson education are trialing this right now all right and the ceo is talking about it they haven't got it right yet but they're trialing it so the game in education is changing as well. The tsunami is coming. All right, in this next section, we're gonna talk further about data analytics and visualization of data. And let's start with the quiz. All right, wave power technology relies heavily on weather and tidal patterns. In order to estimate maximum energy outputs across a year, the designers of these systems look at millions of data points of past weather and tidal patterns. All right, this is an example of which type of analytics. Pause and have a go. Okay, this is predictive analytics. We're using looking at past data sets, trying to predict what's going to happen in the future so that we know um, when maximum energy outputs are going to be across the year. When are, when are our tidal machines going to work really well and when are they not going to work so well? So three types of analytics is described here uh, in the study guide, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, all right? Try and think about it this way. Descriptive, you put the data in, you run basic calculations. Excel, that's, that's a, a platform that you can use, okay? So you jump in there, you enter the data, you write some formulas, okay? Even if the formulas are ifs, you can do a bit of visual basic coding, they're all formulas that are, running calculations around the data points that you've put in to give you ratios, to give you a trend analysis or, or whatever it is. Predictive, you're considering things now like seasonality. You, you're looking at past trends, but you're, move, you're now taking that to say, I want to estimate the forecast. So you've got to take in a lot more data points. You can't just look at a past trend of a month to then estimate what might happen five months down the track. How can you use this? Well, sure, things like customer behaviours. You're testing that, you're trying to understand when should we put things on sale? When should we discount? What days of the week do I get a better open rate on our emails to you guys, to the students? All of this stuff I've done before in terms of the way that we use MailChimp. Uh, when we used to do sales campaigns, when we did them, how we did them, AB splits, use of colours, everything coming back to what have I got in the past as a data point that I can estimate might be successful in the future? Prescriptive, all right, prescriptive analytics. Now, I think one way to think about prescriptive is to move in this idea of game theory a bit more and the fact that you've got, you can have different nodes and you're trying to work out things like maximum payoffs. So you might know a bit about game theory and probability. You've got two choices, don't worry about what this particular thing is. It's more just a visual graphic. Um, you've got a choice where you can go down a path, sorry, three choices, three different paths, and then you reach another node. And those nodes can be uh, an event node or a decision node. And where they're decision nodes, you can path off much. You can serve more food or you can do nothing, right? And if your, if your node ends at an endpoint, that's what happens, and you can have a payoff at each one. And what you do here is you start to multiply, you work backwards, you can multiply your payoffs. So when this tree is actually got three and a half thousand branches coming off it, you can still, what they call roll back 
the the tree it was a term roll back the um, decision model to find things like maximum payoffs so you're trying to then use that to make decisions on where which way you should move on a particular strategy even now we've got this I and mean, then we've got this thing of data visualization so we know we're seeing all these big big tables in excel that can have um we can have like heaps more rows now i can't remember 100,000 rows whatever data and how, how many of the columns that you've got and this is how things have been presented and we we all know excel graphs don't we we should as accountants but yeah things are starting to change um, heat maps have been around for a while, but of course now it's about the amount of data they can get in and crunch and the accuracy level that they can they can get to is so much greater. So here's an example um, from one of the software companies that the study guide mentions. I can't remember which one I've taken it from. Um, examples of what some of the visualization representation can be. Okay, so this is California drought conditions 2013 to 2015 using a heat map, but therefore you've got to have um, not just temperatures, but no doubt you've got to have uh, humidity and levels of water in the ground. I don't know where the water table is and how it's changing to show you the, the areas of drought, rainfall, obviously. Another example, what about people visiting an airport? So not only how many people have come in um, when they went to, sorry, I know this is small, but whether they went to restaurants, uh, whether they went to retail shops, um wherever they went to but then physically where were they so you can show again using uh different colors and a diagram of the actual airport so these are all the gates running out in the different directions but then you've got mini restaurants here and shops and whatnot showing where the visitors are actually going why would you do that so you can estimate resource you can estimate where new shops should be you can estimate which areas the cleaners should be in longer at two in the morning um, to keep the place looking good. A couple of key things here about multi-dimensional multi -dimensional visualizations. Two things, data representations and manipulation. In data representations, I want you to remember that things that you can do, use color and shape, use intensity and size. Think of a, a bubble chart. So you've got the bubbles of areas and that might be the average um, house prices and then you've got how many houses were sold. Okay, so then the volume might will make the bubble bigger or smaller and you put that across a geographic map, you can show warehouses are being sold and also what the average selling prices are for different areas, right? Using animation is obviously another way of representing data to somebody. With this, you're going to consider data manipulations, okay? That can be things like changing the scale or introducing a new scale. The way that you group variables so that the, com the complexity with metadata, metadata is just the first row in the Excel of all the different data categories. But the more data we get, the more we can break it up. Then you've got this issue where you've got, you know, 400 categories of data. What on earth do you do with all of that? Well, you think about how you can bucket it. Which ones stay in? Which ones need to go? You, you've got to get a valuable output at the end. So grouping variables is a way of doing that. And another way, manipulation is condensing categories in order to find the most valuable insights you can from the data. And this is really challenging, absolutely. Okay, quick quiz here, what's wrong with this graph? A, B, C or D? There is too much chart junk, all right? I know that's, that term might sound weird, but it's in the study guide. So please have a look um, at that section on data visualization and you'll be able to tell me what it is but page 97 around there 96 97 um, chart junk meaning that basically what they say is these these funky looking 3d uh, charts that we've all done in excel at some time in our career are not actually that amazing because it's difficult to tell the difference okay so is this one higher or lower than that one because right? in the sense it's not 3D, that we're looking at a 3D representation on 2D screen or a 2D piece of paper. What's the actual difference here between this one, this one, and this one? It's really, really hard to see. All right? It's too much chart junk. 
The other thing to consider with uh, visualization, uh, zooming and panning. So zooming is the ability to go in and in and in. So, so you know that it's um, uh, that we talked about car accidents before. You know that it's um, under 25 or under 26 year old males in Australia that have a higher probability of car accidents. I want to dive in. Whereabouts do they live? I want to dive in. What sort of industries do they work in? I want to dive in. Um, what's their average income? What sort of cars do they drive? I want to understand more and more and more about whether there's an insight as to which are the most at risk. Okay. Panning is where you zoom the focus on other, other areas. So I'm diving in on detail and then I can focus on other areas. Uh, perhaps I, I, I have since sort of zoomed out and I pan across to consider um, weather conditions and other things in terms of the, the amount of accidents and start to look at that. And then probably you would pan across and then zoom in again. All right, so there's the sort of two, two things that, it, that it, again, we've always done, but the power of technology, be able to do it with a couple of clicks is change stuff. Okay, we'll finish off this section with big data and accounting. So accounting applications, management accounting, documenting and understanding business needs, right? Um, assisting with data-driven decisions. That's what SMAs are, should be trying to do in terms of utilising and working in teams where you're interacting with lots and lots of data. And advisory services can be things like modelling improvements for business processes because you have all this data. So advisory, big data, Six Sigma, being able to go in and advise on how to make very, very small changes, but across a massive economies of scale, huge cost reductions. Improving tax performance, an area I don't know anything about, so I'm saying nothing more. Financial reporting, analysing transactions, all right? audit, interrogating all transactions, reducing the chance of missing non-compliance. Audit's a big one to me because auditing is traditionally taking a sample, having a look at that sample, how do you know they got the sample right? The sampling methodologies and the partners come in and they talk to the board and chief risk officer about how they're going to do that. But the fact is you're not analysing every transaction. And some people that want to hide things will always be able to hide it well as we would know from all sorts of news stories in the financial services industry that, and a Royal Commission. Okay, there are um, four key areas and some sub points to think about when you read that section towards the end here of Part B on big, big data and accounting. Summary of Part B, we looked at, had a look at target and we, and uh, in terms of thinking about big data where it can go wrong. And just putting this one up because I want you to, again, remember this idea of complexity in the weak model. Okay, that's those first two there. We went further and we had a quick think about data mining, both the, the power of it for a Woolworths to sell insurance, the danger of it from a Cambridge Analytica, which you can read an example or go further, go, go deeper and really master and understand that. Have a look at the podcast or look up other things. There's so much on data mining on the web that you can look at. Um, targeting customers, as I talked about, at an individual level helps you be able to sell products. Understanding descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive data. Data visualization, multi-dimensional representations, representations and manipulation. Applications to accounting that we just mentioned briefly then. Um, think about how it's applied, strategic management accounting, advisory services, financial reporting, and auditing. And auditing will come up again and again because in the next section, we will talk about things like blockchain, which are pro is probably going to fundamentally change auditing. And that is the end of part A and part B of module two.